Chapter 7. The Final Leg to, Ma to Namanga After a breakfast of yogurt, ugali, and tea, the boys donned their backpacks, gave thanks to his cousin, took their leave, and followed Idris back to the dirt path. It grew to a dirt road, and Idris explained that four-wheel drive vehicles carrying tourists and photo safaris sometimes used it. They'd walked about a half hour when they saw deer-like animals ahead, bounding through the savannah's grass. As they came closer, Idris pointed out antelope, impala, and most abundant, Thompson gazelles. Further on, at a high point over a swampy valley, they paused to enjoy both the scenery itself and the chance to view two zebra families grazing peacefully. As they continued, a four-wheel drive came toward them, blowing up a cloud of dust, and they stepped off the road to let it pass. A half hour later, the same vehicle came up behind them, and they stepped aside, but it stopped. Idris walked to the driver's window, chatted, and motioned the boys to jump into the back seat. Thanks to a group of tourists rescheduling, they now had a free ride almost all the way to Namanga. Idris continued to act as their tour guide, pointing out a small herd of elephants, a giraffe family, and a small herd of water buffalo. The driver spoke occasionally to Idris, but he was in a rush and the vehicle rattled and swayed as they sped along. Despite his constant maneuvering, he hit potholes, hit them so often the boys felt like they'd been run over by a confusion of wildebeests. Going fast, he hit one huge hole, just as the moment that Rookie had removed his seatbelt to fix a twist. Rookie flew up, his shoulder hit the vehicle's roof, and he landed on Leo's lap. Hey, nice acrobatics, bro. Look for a job in the circus when we get home. When the truck dropped them off at a fork in the road, Idris said, That ride left us only about a two-hour walk to my place. We'll cross from Tanzania into Kenya uh, through the wooded area just ahead to avoid the hassle at the new border control station. Shortly after they emerged from the woods, more signs of hu human habitation came into view. First occasional farmhouses, then small clusters of houses, then the road surface became packed red dirt, and soon they reached the outskirts of Namanga. They walked for 10 minutes along the busy, noisy main highway to Nairobi, turned, the, turned right at a side street, and arrived at Idris's white single-story house with a small front porch and two chairs. I live here with my older brother, Lebu, the Idris said. I'll let him introduce himself, but I see a note saying he'll be back only late this evening. I'll set up cots for you in this room when it's time for bed. For now, how about you kick back and relax on the porch? There's the washroom. I'll go pick up something for dinner and be back shortly. Leo and Ricky cleaned up and sat on the porch and watched people walk past on the dusty road. They just returned, made dinner, and they were asleep before Lebu returned. Chapter 8. An Unusual Start to the Day The rhythmic drumming started started softly and slowly. The volume and speed increased. It was coming from the kitchen. It became loud and tense. Leo and Rookie's eyes opened only gradually, but they sat up quickly in their cots when a tall man, taller than Idris, sat down on a chair next to them. He looked fierce. He was dressed in the Maasai style, but with heavy, colorful, braided beads around his neck wrists, ankles, and they were worn as earrings. His face warmed. He became animated, and his smile grew to a gigantic size. He slowed his beating on the pot, put it down, opened his arms wide, and said, Welcome, young man. I understand you have a day to spend with my brother and me in our dusty little town. My name is Le Bou, and I would be most pleased to show you around. The sun had not yet risen. Rookie wanted to cover his head with his pillow, but knew it would be impolite. Le Bou explained he needed to make a short trip for work now and thought it would be interesting for the boys to accompany him. They agreed, 
and Labu said, Okay, then. We leave in ten minutes. After a quick breakfast of flat chapati bread and a bowl of yogurt, Leo jumped into the front and working into the back of Labu's old small SUV and were speeding out of town on a dirt road with the headlights soon showing they had reached the bush. During the hour-long drive, Labu explained it was rare for a Maasai to leave the tribe, but that he had chosen to become a lion guardian, and Leo and Idris sometimes assist him. I was younger than you two when my father started training me to hunt lions. After much hard work accompanying others on lion hunts, and after learning to contain my fear, I left my manyata, that's my home in the community, set off on my own hunt, and succeeded in spearing a lion. But shortly after bringing its mane and tail back home and being celebrated, I changed my thinking. A Maasai man from the from another tribe came and told us our home here on Amboseli was home to only half the lions that were here fifty years ago, and we must learn to coexist with them. I was very troubled and did not know what to do. I hoped my brother Idris would not kill a lion when his time came, but he and his friends were excited to prove themselves, and when a lion took some of our cattle, Idris went on his own hunt. I knew he needed to take action to, I knew I needed to take action to help my people adapt Maasai culture to be more in harmony with our changing environment, but leaving my tribe to live in a town and work with conservation groups, it was a difficult choice. In another few kilometers, we will arrive where a nomadic tribe of about 25 makes its home in a cluster of trees that conceal a mound of rocks. They are not Maasai. They have no houses and no livestock, but occasionally keep a small garden. My task here is to convince them to give up their annual lion hunt. Now, the reason I woke you so early was so we'd arrive before their, war their warriors depart for their daily game hunt. I'm hoping they'll agree to allow you two to accompany them. Does that interest you? Woo-hoo, Leo said. It sure does. Rookie said, this is exciting. Will they have spears or bows they can let us use? It was full light now and showed that the dirt road had become a little used but wide path. A mud hut and another building not far away appeared in a grassy field on the right side. Labu drove past them, uh, those buildings, entered a wooden area, and after another kilometer pulled into a clearing near the path and stopped. The boys followed as he made his way up a, a small path and pointed to a clump of trees. That is their home. See those big rounded rocks on the edge of the trees? There's a huge pile behind. The men tend to fire that at night and with the rocks, they have good protection from the animals. Stay here while I check to see if they agree to see us. It was a long ten minutes before Labu emerged from the trees. Ha! Oh, they slept later than usual today. They did agree to take you on the hunt, but the head man said to tell you. The game is quite scarce, and half the time they return empty-handed. He did agree to lend you bows and arrows, but only if you show you know how to use them. Leo looked at Rookie and made a face with exaggerated fright, and then he smiled. A short, wiry, barefoot man with few front teeth and leathered skin approached them. He held out two bows. A boy followed with a handful of arrows. The man walked under, the, under a tree, pulled out something tan and dirty, about half the size of a basketball. He threw it on the ground and brusquely waved his hand at Leo and Rookie. Labu said, That hunk of animal hide is a target he uses to teach boys. He wants you to shoot at it. Rookie accepted an arrow from the boy, 
walked to where he could better see the target, quickly raised his bow, pulled back the string, released it, and nailed the hide, pushing it backward. The man waved his hand and pointed to Leo. The boo said, That arrow bouncing off is normal because the wooden tip could never pierce that tough old hide. It was a good shot. Leo signaled for an arrow. But the boy first followed the man's wave, ran to the target, and pushed it farther back and under a tree. Leo loosed the arrow and it tipped the corner of the hide. The boy ran to him with another arrow. Leo quickly raised his bow, fired, and nailed the hide dead center. He looked at the man who waved, waved both boys to come. He handled them arrows with sharp metal tips waved to three men who had been watching from the rocks. Chapter 9. The Hunt Without warning, the head men set off behind the rocks at a blistering pace. The pace was similar to a school's 100-meter dash, but the terrain made it a steeplechase through tall grass over logs, rocks, and holes, down steep banks over streams and up hillsides. Both boys were knackered, but knew if they fell behind, they'd miss the hunt. Worse yet, they could get lost. And still worse, some animals might hunt them. The head man stopped and raised his hand. All stopped. There was no sign of life, not a sound, not even a bird call. They stood in the open grass with trees ahead, bushes to the left, and a deep ravine on the right. The leader sent hand signals and the three, three warriors dispersed, two into the ravine and one to its ridge. He gave no sign to Leo and Rookie, but darted ahead and to his left. Neither boy know, knew if they should, but they followed at top speed through the narrow stretch of trees and on to another clearing. A brown bird flushed up. It reached about eight meters high when its feathers flew out into the air and it plummeted down. The leader dashed to the bird, removed his arrow, and placed the bird in a thin brown sack around his waist. The boys watched him dash toward the ravine, and they followed. But he was fast, so fast they lost him. They searched, and they saw, didn't see him, none of the men, and what to do? Climb back to the open patch of grass. They waited to be found, and 15 minutes later, the leader stepped from the trees and waved for them to follow him. They fast walked under and through tall bushes until he stopped, knelt, and broke off a dead stick. And he dug into the soil. He scooped out a tuber about the size of a medium potato. He stuck it in his sack, searched around, dug out four or five others, looked further, then waved for them to follow. They walked back to the tribe's site where he took their bows without looking at them or smiling even and just walked away, leaving them standing in the dusty spot where they'd shot arrows that morning. They stood in the sun for a while, walked under the tree for a closer look at the hunk of hardened animal hide they'd shot at, and eventually, a few minutes passed, but Leo uh, Lebu emerged from the rocks. I heard it was an unsuccessful hunt. The headman says his buff-crested bustard won't come close to feeding this group, not even for breakfast. He found a few tubers, but they are becoming scarce, too. The tribe would be moving on in days. As they walked to the SUV, Lebu said, There's one more thing I'd like to show you. It's a short way back in distance and a short way forward in civilization. He turned the old SUV back down the same dirt path and stopped between the two buildings they'd noticed on the way in. Before getting out, he reached down to the floor and picked up a long, rusted nail. Holding it up, he said, You're going to see what I consider real-life magic. Thin smoke was curling out the side window as they walked up. The front was now totally open, and a blacksmith was hammering a point onto a metal stake in an, on an anvil. An open furnace was behind him with a box of irregular charcoal next to it. The boo talked with a man who took a, a, the nail and placed it in the furnace. And Lubu told the boys, 
The blacksmith says his wife is away in the field, and you're welcome to take a look at his home or loaf under a tree while he works on something for you. The boys stuck their head in the entryway of the small mud hut, noticed a lingering smoke smell and remains of an open fire with an iron pole for holding a pot. The floor was bare dirt, clothes hung from sticks in the roof, sleeping mats, farm tools, and firewood were stashed along the oval wall. The entire living space was far smaller than one of their bedrooms at home. We're so lucky living in a developed country, Leo whispered. The boo sat in his truck waiting for the blacksmith, so Leo and Rookie sat under a nearby tree, pulled their caps over their eyes, and tried to recover a bit of the sleep they'd missed that morning. Come on over, you guys, and take a look, the boo called out. The old nail from the SUV's floor had been transformed into a broad and pointed spear tip with two rows of 18 sharp tines that would make it nearly impossible for it fall, could fall out on its own or for the target animal to pull it out by rubbing on a tree. The blacksmith occasionally tribes these for, for tr uh, trades these for nomadic tribes meat. The boys thanked the blacksmith for the fine piece of art he'd done, left him money, and thanked Labou. They drove back to town, and when they arrived at the house, Labou said he needed to go to work. The Idris was out now, but he had a plan for them for the evening. The boys were on their own. They decided to sit on the porch and just loaf. After Labou left, Ricky shoved his hand in his pants pocket and pulled out the spear blade. He'd wrapped it in tissues to protect himself, but the tines and point had easily popped through. I felt it prick at my skin, but wow, this baby could have done me some damage if I forgot it was there. Leo, I know Labou gave that to both of us, but I'm giving you my half. If you keep it, the world is safe from it, and the only thing in danger is your butt. Rookie. Whoa, remember, I'm the one who nailed that target with the first arrow. If I put this on the tip of a spear and carry it to the jungle, the lions will all head for the hills. Leo. Perhaps if you wounded yourself with it, they'd take you for a tasty snack. Rookie. You're making me think of AMSL again. Maybe it didn't tell your future, but told mine. Maybe it means amazing master of savage lions. Leo, yeah, right. Where were you, brave boy, when the Maasai asked you if you wanted some blood spurted in your mouth? Rookie, well, I'll tell you where I wasn't. I wasn't practicing my jumping so all the girls would fall for me. That was you. Leo, no, you were bouncing off the roof of a jeep because you didn't know how to buckle a seatbelt. Imagine if you had had that spear point in your pocket then. Rookie, while you were imagining, imagine me pulling out my bow and shooting down a flying bird with that arrow point. Leo, I could if my mind wasn't seeing you lost forever in fog. Rookie, if you hadn't distracted me, I would have sung Yellow Submarine and everyone on the mountain would have run through the fog to find me. Leo, if you sang it down there, we would have been safer than when you sang it up on the steep slope. Your sour notes loosened rocks and almost killed the people below us. Ow! Ow! Oh! Idris called, suddenly appearing in front of the house with his hands over his ears. You do are having an attack of snarkitis. Owen, what's snarkitis? Idris, it's when two people get caught up being snarky. Ricky, I can't stop. It's too much fun. Idris, the fun will stop when one of you feels offended. It might hurt for a long time and lead to other consequences you never intended or thought about. Come on inside. 
I brought home some roasted maize ears for snacks, and I want to tell you about our plan for tonight. Chapter 10 The Night of the Full Moon First, I got you tickets on tomorrow's only non-stop bus to Nairobi, so you'll be headed home, Idris told him as they munched corn on the cob. It'll be nice to be home, but a shame to leave, Leo said. We've learned so much from you and Labu. Thank you. And thanks for getting us up to Kilimanjaro's peak. Thanks for the visit to your village. And gee, just for bringing us here, Rookie said. Idris replied, I'm glad you learned some things, but there's more ahead. Tonight is a full moon perfect for watching wildlife that sleeps during the day but eats or hunts at night. I know a big animal watering hole that has a safe vantage point for viewing. Want to check it out before you go home? Yeah, sure. Lebu cannot join us because he'll be working with park rangers, and that's because the full moon is also prime time for poachers. Tonight, he's not worried about the small-time bush meat poachers. They don't work at night because they use snares. That's Those are loops of wire that catch an animal's foot and tighten. Tonight, the rangers and Labu are watching for the nasty guys who use high-powered rifles to kill lions for trophies and elephants for their ivory and rhinos for their horns. He's also watching for farmers angry about destroyed crops. They use spotlighting dogs and pit traps to catch and kill them. When the afternoon drew to a close, they ate some ugali and yogurt and headed for the SUV. Idris stashed a frightening-looking spear in the back, saying, Just in case, and giving a big smile. Leo brought his backpack, but not Rookie. The drive into the bush took more than an hour, and it was dusk when they started following Idris as he bushwhacked his way toward the watering hole. Hey, look at here, he said, pointing to a branch. Those little guys are called bush babies. They're nocturnal primates. Cute, eh? Two of them could fit in your hand. See what happens when I come close and scare them? A loud, shrill, crying shrill rang out. Shrill crying, yeah. The two boys looked at each other, and Idris nodded, saying, Just like human babies, right? Darkness was closing fast when Idris stopped and signaled the boys to stand by him. See that? It's a crusted porcupine. They weigh 10 to 15 kilos. He's dark, but his quills are light-colored, probably because he wants you to see them and stay away. If he is attacked, he'll curl up and push them out to defend his soft, defenseless underbelly. They couldn't avoid tripping and branches hitting them as they walked, and total darkness fell just as they came to the top of a small hill. It was crowned by a large tree and lush grass. Idris said, The moon will rise soon. You'll see the watering hole below us, and eventually animals will come to drink. Hey, no need to wait for the moon to check it out, Leo commented as he unzipped a compartment on the side of his pack. He removed a 20-centimeter-long leather tube, saying, I have night vision monocular. He put it to his eye and looked down at the watering hole at surrounding trees and grasses. The monocular's clear images, tinged by green shading, revealed thick bushes below and to the left of the water, a ridge directly across that sloped to a natural water access point straight ahead of them, tall bushes and trees covering the water's right bank. Rookie asked, mind if I take a look? And he walked around Idris toward Leo. Ah, what's that? He said louder than he should have. Idris leaned over, beamed his small flashlight at Rookie's foot, and told him he'd stepped into a colossal pile of rhino poop. Leo trained his monocular on it. 
Dude, it's over your boot and halfway up your shin. Get out of here and don't shake any of that on me. Rookie was not a happy camper. Idris shone his light as Rookie sat against the tree, removed his disgusting boot, wiped down his leg, and scraped the poop off his sock and boot. Leo said, That stuff's all bright green. At least the rhino had a healthy diet. Rookie's face was hidden by the darkness, but everybody knew he wasn't smiling. Leo said, You know, you could have a clean sock on the outside if you just turned that one inside out. Rookie began to say something rude when Idris said, No, this is a no-snark zone and we need to be quiet now. Rookie fumed and continued work on his sock. The moon was rising through the trees, but the water remained in shadow for another half hour. Leo passed the monocular around, but nobody saw a thing. The moon was almost above the trees when Rookie spotted a zebra climbing the side of the ridge and then spotted the heads of two others following it. They stood on the ridge, looked warily around, and descended to drink. Four water buffalo arrived, waded out into the water, drank, and left. Oh, it'll be hard to ever go to a zoo again, Rookie whispered. Leo scanned darker areas under the bushes and trees to see if any predators had sneaked in. I see some movement in the bushes on the right, well above the water. I can't make out what it could be. He passed the monocular to Idris. I can't see what's causing it, but the bushes are moving and it is not the wind, he said. Five minutes later, the moon was above the trees. The lake was fully visible and more light was penetrating the trees and bushes on the right. Idris looked again. Oh, no, not here. There must be three or four of them, he said in a loud whisper. Poachers, and I saw a glint of a rifle. Rookie asked, can you phone Le Bou? No. Only radios work here. Swaying branches signaled a flurry of activity around the same spot. The three looked to the ridge and saw why. A single large male lion was approaching from the left of the ridge. It was beautiful, regal, the king of the jungle. Leo whispered, Oh no, we've got to save it, but, but how? Should I yell to scare it away? we got to take a chance. Idris said, That rifle will fire at us if we give away our location. Leo picked up stones and threw them. Some hit the water, some hit the far bank with a small thud. The lion paid no attention. Leo found a flat stone the size of his hand and skimmed it off the water to the far bank. But the lion wasn't phased and it started down to the water. Without looking at the others, Leo said, We need to save its life. I am taking a gamble for all of us. Yeah! He hollered as loud as he could, Go away! Go away! <clears throat> the lion dropped down as if to spring. A rifle shot sprang out, rang out. The lion turned, ran up the bank, and was out of sight behind the ridge in an instant. The spotlight shone in their direction. Then two spotlights. Leo's face was lit. Idris pulled him to the ground and under the hill's lip. Rookie hid by the side of the tree. Two men with spotlights walked toward the center of the ridge. A man followed with a rifle ready. The lights scanned their direction. Leo unzipped his knapsack, pulled out two long pieces of metal, and snapped them together. It was the MMLL, the Marshmallow Launch and Laser Fire. He reached his hand deep into a pile of rhino poop. He loaded the blaster and held it across his chest. The lights continued to scan near them. Leo would be a sitting duck if he showed himself, but he jumped to his feet. The spotlights lit him up like a neon sign. The poacher's rifle came up, but Leo pulled his trigger. The poacher crashed to the ground and his rifle dropped to the dirt. The two others rushed toward him. Leo pulled the trigger again. 
A balloon of flammable gel hit the poacher on his hip, splashing him and everything around him. Leo pulled trigger number two. The poacher and surrounding area exploded in flame as the MML's laser ignited the gel. The two spotlights fell to the bank. The two men dove into the water to wet themselves, rushed back up to the rifleman, and rolled his flaming body into the water. They all stumbled back up the bank. The two picked up their spotlights and locked them on the trio's location. The rifleman picked up his gun and fired. Bullets slammed into the dirt. They nicked the trees, sprang out shards of bark. They whistled through the leaves and broke branches above them. The rifleman called out to a fourth man, their driver. He ran from the bush with three machetes, and he ran back with a rifle. The three charged into the bushes on the right side of the pond. They're coming for us, Idris said. The truck started and soon filled the air with the roar of its engine and the sound of cracking branches as it plowed through bushes on the higher ground toward the trio's position. Leo took another chance. Light might change the game and favor the trio. He, re he reached into his backpack and pulled out what could have been a giant water pistol. With two hands, he aimed it above and to the right of the water and ignited a small rocket that whooshed skyward. The rocket trailed flame and flashed when it was 40 meters over the water. A miniature drone emerged and hung stationary, flooding the entire area with 20 powerful LED lights. The three poachers screamed to each other, and they chanted. Rookie and Leo didn't need to know Maasai or Swahili to know a murderous rage was coming at them. The sounds of their foot charge through the jungle signaled a relentless advance, and the more distant roar of a four-wheel drive truck said they would need to fight on two fronts. Idris started to charge directly at the sounds of the three, but Leo grasped his arm and held him back. Is there a clearing nearby that, that you can lead them to? Idris nodded, pointed, and ran toward it, spear in hand, making all the noise he could to pull the three toward him. Leo grabbed his pack and followed with Ricky. The LEDs lit the small clearing like daytime. Idris stood erect with his spear at his, at his back edge. The three angry guys shouted and came closer. Leo stood with his backpack next to Idris. He pulled out a long tube-like canister and handed it to Rookie on his left and said, Only on my command. Then he pulled out a disc-shaped object. The trio stood tall in a straight line. Crashing and howling came from only meters into the far side of the cl clearing. The sound of truck tires spinning in mud came from higher ground on their right. One man arrived at the clearing, spotting them, and stopped at the far side. The two others arrived. They looked at each other and nodded. Then three grinning, machete-wielding men marched forward for the slaughter. The machetes were fifty centimeters long and glinted under the LED's glare. They stayed in lockstep, one hand on the handle, the other supporting the blade in front of them. Death and dismemberment were 20 meters away. Leo took three steps toward them. <laughs> Their smiles grew, and the riflemen they knew it was him because he was covered in filth, pumped his left fist, and raised his machete vertically, and smiled, disgusting, disgusting smile. Leo tightened his grip on the disc-shaped object. It was the side of, size of two dinner plates and as thick as his wrist. Without warning or wind-up, he moved his left foot forward and threw it like a frisbee. The disc sailed to the right of the men, trailing a wire attached to a ring on Leo's finger. He rotated his wrist to direct the discourse. It arced 
from the right to behind the three murderous poachers headed back toward him and then circled them four times before flying back. Leo double-tapped the disc center button. Its internal spool vibrated ferociously as it reeled in the wire. The three poachers were violently thrown together. Heads, shoulders, and chests collided, and the three fell in a heap. Leo double-tapped the disc, and the wire slowly pulled tight. He stopped the reel when he heard cries of pain. Then he looked over his shoulder and said, Now, bro. Ricky charged toward the murderous poacher poachers as they writhed and cursed. Their machetes were on the ground. He kicked them away, raised the canister, flipped open a protective cover, held it at arm's length, pulled the, pushed the button on the top, and sprayed out a white substance as he circled them. He quit when Leo called out, Save some! Number four is approaching on foot. Rookie had barely reached the others when a rifle barrel cautiously protruded from under a branch to their right. The branch shook. The rifle's bolt threw in a cartridge. The barrel came up. And then the man fell forward into the clearing. The shaft of the spear protruding from his gut broke when it hit the ground. A vicious iron spearhead protruded from his back. The sound of another vehicle reached him. Oh, no, we're out of weapons, Leo called out. We have three machetes, Rookie responded. He stuffed the canister through his belt, collected the machetes, ran to Leo, and Idris joined them. The vehicle noise stopped. The three stood in silence in the shadow of a large branch alert to hear the advance of the second wave of poachers. Idris told the boys, If the poachers have firearms, we will turn tail and run for our lives. If the poachers will machetes, we'll fight. The jungle grew quiet, maddenly quiet, nothing to hear, nothing to see. One of the 20 LED lights failed. All remained completely still. Then from behind came, Idris, you're spending too much time climbing mountains. If I were a lion, you would be my midnight snack. Lebu stepped into the clearing, followed by an Amboseli park ranger. The ranger walked out to the huge white blob in the clearing, nudged it with its foot, then tapped it with its knuckles. The muffled words were unintelligible, but their tone told their meaning. Chapter t 11. Get on the bus. The bus was scheduled to leave at 10 a.m. Labu, Idris, Leo, and Rookie arrived early. As they stood together in the dusty lot that served as a bus station, Labu said, We'd sure be happy if you guys decided to stay here. Your work last night is already getting around, and rangers have heard poachers say they'll, they're no match for the technology of the future. I'm certain many will change their line of work or retire. A photo of that white blob is in the in the clearing will be on the cover of this afternoon's newspapers and on the TV news tonight. If you'd like to develop more ingenious tools to help save wildlife, we'd welcome them with open arms. Idris said, Ditto that for me. There must be many interesting things you could do in this world, but for sure you'd make a big difference here and find non-stop excitement. He was interrupted by the roar of the bus pulling in from Arusha. As passengers got off and the boys lined up with new passengers to get on, Rookie said, Idris Labu, I've learned so much from you about your country, its wildlife and people. I can't thank you enough. Leo added, There were so many things. I don't know where to start start my own thank yous. These experiences will stay in my mind for a long time. Kilimanjaro. 
your Maasai village, the breakfast hunt, and of course last night. And Idris, both of us will try to tamp down our snarkitis, but no promises. Their turn to get on came. They found their seats, waved, and were off. They settled in, and Leo turned to Rookie. You know, bro, I had thought of a dozen ways to razz you about stepping in that rhino poop, but I decided Idris is right, and we should back off our snark sessions. Back off taking, I don't know, taking a piece of each other in general. But I have to say this, with the sun having melted my marshmallows, we both know that if you hadn't stepped in that poop, I wouldn't have had any ammunition for the MML, MLL, and we might not be here at all. Rookie said, well, <laughs> I'm happy to know I won't be forever hearing about that poop. So in thanks, I'm declaring that AMSL really stands for Amazing MML Saves Lions. The series of long days and the swaying of the bus closed their eyes and they didn't open them again until they arrived in Nairobi. Chapter 12, Two Stories. The boys did as Pops had asked and took a taxi to the hotel. Leo was ready with his new credit card, but he didn't need it since Mom and Pops had arrived ahead of them. They knocked on the door, hugged all around, jumped onto the bed and told their story. Mom and Pops were amazed by all that Leo and Rookie had learned about the Maasai, African wildlife on the savanna and in the forest. And they loved hearing how Leo's inventions and the boy's courage had defeated the poachers. Mom asked, did you learn anything else? Leo replied, I learned we're incredibly lucky to live in a society that has developed lots of tools and conveniences and we don't need to worry about being killed by animals or desperate people. Pop said, That's a big lesson. We'll talk more about that later. But first I want to know, did you try to recruit Lebu and Idris as blue marble defenders? Leo said, No, but on the other hand, they didn't try to recruit us as lion guardians. But Pops, you and Mom beat us to Nairobi. What happened and, and why was it such a quick assignment? Were the extraterrestrials up on Kilimanjaro out of breath and easy to snare? Well, Pop said, we searched the glaciers, the ice caves inside them, the boulder fields, everything from Gilman Point to the top of Uhuru Peak. There were no extraterrestrials, but what we did find was a leopard. Leo and Rookie gave a double take and Pops continued. We called the director of national parks and he reminded us that Ernest Hemingway, the famous writer, had written a short story called The Snows of Kilimanjaro in 1936 that told of the freeze-dried carcass of a leopard lying along the crater's edge at a spot now called Leopard's Point. It was 20 minutes in the wrong direction when we climbed to Gilman's Point so we forgot about it. He said another leopard carcass had been spit out of the glacier in 1997, and dating systems said that it probably had lain in the glacier for over 700 years. So it may not be unusual for leopards to make their way up here, whether they're chasing game who tried to escape, or who knows, maybe they just wanted to see the world from on high. The net is, we decided that people who thought they saw an extraterrestrial just couldn't believe they were seeing a leopard. With the government's agreement, we let the leopard go all about its business and we headed down. So now, the important question, who in this family votes we stay in Africa and who votes we go home? Rookie said, that's easy. We head for the airport. It's still baseball season. And that's the end.